Hello, ladies and gentlemen, John Randall, CEO of Zyvex Labs, once again. The next generation of extreme resolution e-beam lithography is in fact what we're referring to when we refer to the patterning, the atomic precision and atomic resolution patterning technique that we have been developing. Uh, it's, uh, we've claimed it's uh, much, much better than uh, the best that's available. And so we're gonna compare directly to the current uh, leader uh, in terms of the champion of ultra high resolution uh, uh, patterning, that is e-beam lithography. But we also must admit that uh, e-beam lithography has, uh, much like Moore's law, has reached its limits uh, to a large extent. Still, uh, some improvement is possible. The dramatic improvements are gone. It's really reached its limits in resolution, precision, and throughput, although there is some chance uh, and some very success with some multi, significant success with multi e-beam tools these days. But to a quarter of a million uh, beamlets only get you about a factor of 10 improvement in throughput. And so uh, no dramatic gains in throughput on conventional e-beam. But let's look at the resolution. Uh, uh, I've been doing e-beam lithography for a very long time. And uh, for a long time, uh, things got better by reducing the spot size of the lithography tool, the e-beam tool, by going to better sources, better optics, and uh, in fact, uh, higher energies. And so, in fact, sub-nanometer spot sizes are possible with high voltages and aberration corrected lenses. However, this does not, at this point in time, what limit the re it's not what limits the resolution of e-beam lithography. In fact, it's the point spread function. Even if we get infinitesimally small spot size, we can't pattern arbitrarily small features because the point spread function spreads out the deposited energy and the resist uh, uh, away from the finely focused electron beam. And there's a number of different things that, that work here. Forward scattering of the electrons uh, as it passes through the resist spreads the beam out. And in fact, you can reduce that by going to higher and higher energies and thinner and thinner resists, uh, both of which have been done. Uh, backscattering of the electrons when they, the electrons pass through the resist, interact with the substrate, and then get reflected, uh, scattered back up through the resist, also can limit resolution. The higher you go in energy, the wider that spread out, and that's an advantage and a disadvantage. And finally, uh, the secondary electrons and volume plasmons that are generated by these relativistic electrons uh, that pass through the, the secondary electrons are just scattered long energy electrons. The volume plasmons are, are essentially charge waves created by these high energy electrons blowing through the resist. And both of these significantly spread out the area over which chemical bonds are made and broken. Uh, and so uh, Carl Bergren of MIT's uh, group a few years ago did a beautiful paper really exploring the limits of e beam lithography. And they wanted to minimize these things. So they got a very small spot size by high energy and aberration corrected uh, lenses and a scanning transmission electron microscope. They went with a thin layer of HSQ. It's a negative resist. They almost eliminated backscattering by going with a very thin layer, 10 nanometers of silicon nitride. But again, there's not much they could do about the range of the secondary electrons or volume plasmons. And you, you have to go to these high energies to get the small spot size. So uh, he did both very nice experimental and um, uh, uh, theoretical work. And to make a long story short, uh, his experimental work showed and agreed very well with the theory that you had to go out to almost four nanometers radius before you're down to about 10% of the deposited energy in the resist. And there's a slow, diminishing tail of energies that spread uh, up to quite a few nanometers away from where the, the that, uh, center of the beam is. Now, even with a four nanometer raise at 10%, you can still, by doing the thresholding of your resist and developing very carefully, in fact, they did do a sort of five nanometer feature, at least in the skinny direction, a little bit bigger in the other direction. And you can see that there's quite a bit of line edge roughness in the cross section uh, of uh, the TEM image of that uh, exposed HSQ. So we've gone in a very, un 
sort of uh, like the semiconductor industry has had to go into a very different direction away from simple downscaling of planar devices, uh, we had to go in a very different direction to improve uh, the resolution and precision of EDM lithography. And so we're working with something we call hydrogen depassivation lithography. It's done with a scanning tunneling microscope. Uh, this lithography was actually developed by Joe Lighting at University of Illinois and Fabe McGorris of IBM back in the mid 90s. Uh, it's interesting to compare it to conventional EDM lithography. Uh, there's, we could spend a lot of time doing that comparison. Much lower energies, much higher currents, no optics, mechanical as opposed to EM scanning. The biggest difference really though is in the resist. The resist is this monolayer of hydrogen absorbed on a silicon surface. And the exposure is actually self-development of that resist in ultra high vacuum by breaking that silicon hydrogen bond. It's a very digital response. Uh, you either break that silicon hydrogen bond and you don't. And as it turns out, this ends up being a way, way more precise and way higher resolution tool. Um, uh, just a few moments on this, the silicon 100 surface that we work on dimerizes, makes these beautiful dimer rows. Here's a, a, a stick figure of it. And we take, as we're doing digital lithography, so we have a pixel that's a sub nanometer pixel that's made up of two dimers along a dimer row or four surface silicon atoms. Each one of them has a hydrogen atom attached to it. And we, in fact, can image that at, at low uh, currents and low voltages where we don't break the silicon hydrogen bond. And we can use that as a global fiducial grid to guide our lithography and control where we expose and remove the hydrogen from the resist. Uh, you can see some defects here on the right. That's an STM image, little green uh, crosses at the corners of each pixel. There's a number of defects on the surface. Uh, we've got some room to go to improve that. Actually, the, the vacancy defects aren't a big problem. The dark areas and the bright areas are usually where we're missing hydrogen atoms. Turns out to be not that big of a problem either. Now we can, with this technology, move along a dimer row, scan the tip along a dimer row. And if we do that accurately, we can, uh, which turns out to be, we have some tolerance in doing that, we can routinely make sub nanometer features. And while it's difficult because the tip control with an STM is, is uh, non-trivial, if we position the tip correctly, we can in fact make perfect patterns and remove exactly the hydrogen atoms from the surface that we intend to. And there's a, about a plus or minus of an angstrom of tip tolerance and still allows us to do perfect lithography. Now, what good is a monolayer of hydrogen as resist? Well, it's not a physical resist. It doesn't work as an etch mask, but it is a very effective uh, for uh, a variety of chemistries. Selective deposition mask, for instance, we can do selective ALD for titanium dioxide and then transfer with reactive ion etching that pattern down into silicon. Uh, for, particularly for quantum devices, uh, very nice that Michelle Sh Simmons in Australia has worked out the ability to uh, dose with phosphine where the hydrogen has been removed and get selective deposition of uh, phosphorus atoms, a, a dopant atom, there's other dopant atoms that are coming along. Uh, and then that, that can be buried with a low temperature epitaxy and is a very effective way of making uh, some quantum devices that we and uh, some of our collaborators are doing. Uh, but uh, it's also a very robust process with large, not only uh, uh, small variations in uh, tip position are accepted, but large variations in dose, current, and voltage all still produce these uh, sub nanometer features. And we can even get, although it's a little bit harder, uh, you can get single hydrogen atoms removed. We can target a specific hydrogen atom and pop that hydrogen atom off. Again, we're breaking that silicon hydrogen atom bond. The white little white dots you see uh, some work uh, from quite a while ago by Joe Lighting, where he made an array of, of uh, hydrogen atoms removed from the surface of a, a silicon 100 uh, chip. Um, now, why we can remove a single hydrogen atom, why we have the resolution with the tip about a nanometer away from the surface and having a radius of about 0.3 nanometers, it's a little bit amazing that without any focusing optics that we can uh, do that. Turns out there's a couple of nonlinear effects that make this possible. Uh, 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 recently, we published a, a simple model of this. And uh, one of the reasons why we're getting a sharp 
small spot is simply uh, Pythagorean's theorem shows us that in our model, an infinitely flat conducting sample, as we move further away from the center underneath the beam, we can calculate the extra distance. Uh, tunneling falls off with distance. And so uh, uh, using this very simple model, we can show that we get a dramatic fall off in the very short period of distance underneath the tip. But in fact, it's not sharp enough to really explain our data. Uh, without going into great detail, uh, we're, we're seeing lithography results that are not explained by this fall off of the current. It's just not sharp enough. Turns out the other nonlinear process is the fact that this hydrogen depassivation lithography at low biases is a multi-electron process. And in fact, the single electron hit doesn't have enough energy to, to move up the, uh, the energy ladder of states, but it has enough staying in the ground state it can increase the kinetic energy, take a cold ground state to a hot ground state, and eventually you can build up enough kinetic energy to break the silicon hydrogen bond. That turns out you're competing against some phonon processes that wants to bring it back down to the ground level. So it makes it extremely sensitive to the current level. You gotta have lots of hits of electrons to keep ahead of those uh, phonon interactions. And uh, again, without going into a great deal of detail here, some published data from Joe, we've done some additional measurements uh, uh, that show that there's a really high nonlinearity in the depassivation efficiency. That's the number of electrons it takes to remove a single hydrogen atom. Uh, Joe's data shows it goes with something like the eighth power of current. We show a little bit lower, maybe five or six, six order of power, but it's still an outrageously nonlinear process. So when you apply that dependence on current, the depassivation efficiency dependence on current to the fall off in current because of the tunneling fall off, then we get the sort of sharp exposure uh, uh, that, we, that explains our experimental data. Uh, and so when you compare that with Carl Bergman's experimental data, again, what I've plotted here is our theoretical uh, calculation, but again, it agrees uh, pretty well with our experimental data. Uh, we see we have a way sharper tool, a much, much sharper tool. It turns out it's even sharper than this graph suggests because as anybody who's done e-beam lithography knows, you have the, the proximity effect. You have the tails of your beam uh, are doing partial exposures of the resist. And so uh, it's hard to control uh, the size of what you're exposing because these partial exposures of resist build up due to this proximity effect. Uh, you can correct for it to some extent, but it makes it really hard to control your features. Turns out on the hydrogen depassivation lithography, uh, because it's a binary process, because we're either making or, or, or not, we're either breaking that silicon hydrogen bond or we're not, as soon as we stop hitting on it with electrons, there's no stored energy, there's no stored partial exposure. And so there is no proximity effect. Uh, and anybody done e-beam knows that that's a big deal and it's because of this digital nature. Uh, I'll talk in another, there will be a talk in another section of this virtual booth about how we can further take advantage of this digital nature. But in summary, let's say at least potentially using this hydrogen depassivation lithography, you have a way, way sharper tool to work with. Uh, this comparison of paintbrushes we think is pretty reasonable comparison of what you can do uh, with hydrogen depassivation lithography as opposed to conventional avian lithography. So if you want to do beautiful research, which tool do you want to use? Now, uh, this shows the potential. Uh, we have had to work very hard to get around a lot of the tip positioning errors that you get in scanning tunneling microscopes. Uh, we've had to work very hard on improving the control of the tips so the tips don't crash. So we have other presentations that I hope you'll listen to that explain the improvements we've made in scanning tunneling microscope technology in order to make an automated and eventually much higher throughput through parallelism tool uh, that you can use uh, to make your quantum devices or other devices that just need really high resolution. Again, we're not gonna get the level of parallelism that will allow consumer electronics to be made. This is not relevant to CMOS, but uh, at least not anytime soon. Uh, it is, we think, a very powerful tool. And if you need better patterning, please talk to us. Thank you very much.